You're listening to the Missionary Perspective Podcast with veteran missionaries Eric Johnson and Joshua Mead. We're glad you could join us. We trust this podcast will be both a blessing and a challenge as we relate topics in world evangelism from a missionary perspective. Now, here's Josh and Eric. Welcome to the Missionary Perspective Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Johnson, and I have the great privilege and honor to be joined by one of my really great friends and friends in the ministry, Matt Goins. Matt, it's a pleasure to have you today. Thanks for having me on, Eric. Good to be here. Well, Matt is a missionary in Honduras, but before we get into Matt's story, let me just tell you a little bit how I first met Matt. I believe it was 2003. I believe it was probably April time frame. Matt and his wife, Delita, were on deputation going to Honduras to be church planning missionaries, and he was at the missions conference in our home church in Herndon, Virginia. And uh, now my wife went to Bible college with both Matt and Delita. I won't say how long ago, but we'll just say it was in another century, okay? And uh, no, they got, they knew each other in Bible college. They ran in very similar circles, but I got to meet Matt uh, fast forward about four or five years later. And uh, right away, I felt like we just really hit it off. Uh, we liked a lot of the same things. And then for me as a young guy who was in Bible college at the time and getting very uh, interested about missions and really kind of looking forward, Matt and Delita, uh, even though they're basically the same age as my wife and I, they were always about a life stage, a ministry stage ahead of us, and if not two. So when they were uh, on deputation, having children, going to language school and getting ready to go to the field, my wife and I were a, a few years behind that. So Matt was very often someone I called. In fact, there were one or two guys I always called, and Matt was usually the top of that list whenever I had a question about the next stage of ministry. So what we're doing today, listeners, is something that's happened dozens of times. We're just, today we're recording it. And uh, so, uh, you know, as Matt was in language school and Matt would hit the field, I was usually a step or two behind and we would, uh, I would call him and ask him a lot of advice. So he, he's been a dear friend in the ministry over the years. So that's how Matt and I have our contact and how we know each other and have uh, visit each other's works and stayed in each other's homes and I really have a, a really great relationship. But today we have some really exciting things to talk about when we consider what the Lord has been doing through Matt and Delita and their ministry there over, I want to say, 15, 16 years. Is that correct, Matt? Yeah, we're coming up on 17 years uh, 17 here in Honduras years. and then a year before that in language school. That's amazing. And so what we want to do is start now, Matt, why don't you just fill in the listeners with uh, where you grew up, how you came to know the Lord, and how the Lord specifically called you and Delita to Honduras. All right. So um, I, I grew up in uh, the state of Virginia, and uh, my parents moved to Northern Virginia when I was uh, elementary school, early elementary school. Uh, my mom and dad got saved while I was uh, a young guy, four or five years old, in a small church in, in a little town called Noakesville, Virginia. Uh, that's where they got saved. And uh, I, as a young man, you know, going to church with them, I made a profession of faith as well. Uh, we moved up to Northern Virginia, started going to Fairfax Baptist Temple, Fairfax, Virginia. Great church, you know, solid doctrine and uh, learned a lot there. As I got into my early teenage years, I started to have doubts about my own, uh, you know, profession of faith in Christ. Uh, I wasn't sure, you know, where I was. I, I I didn't really remember what I had done as a, as a four or five year old. And so uh, those doubts started creeping in, uh, but I'm, I'm kind of a shy person by nature, very timid. And so I, I was very concerned about what people would think of, of me in the teen group or at church in general, if uh, they thought all this time that I was a believer. And then, then now I'm having these doubts. I thought that would reflect poorly on me. So I hid those doubts, and um, I would re I remember laying in bed at night thinking if I were to die right now and I don't have this settled uh, where my faith is, then I'll uh, I'll die and go to hell. Uh, but I but I was struggling with those that fear of man, and so I didn't say anything. And then in, as I got into my later teenage years, uh, my heart got very hard. Um, that sensitivity was gone, and and so I started getting in with the wrong crowd, even at you know church Christian school. Um, I was I was playing that hypocritical role that's that's common uh, among um, you know young people growing up in church, and uh, so I knew the the right lingo, the words to say. Yet in my heart, I knew I was I was far from God, and and it got to the point where I knew that I wasn't saved. It was not no longer a doubt. 
It was more of, uh, yeah, I know where I am. And, and, and then it changed to uh, what's going to happen is I'm going to wait. I'm going to live my life now, live for myself now. And then uh, as I get older and, and get, death is near, then I'll uh, make the decision to trust in Christ and kind of get my ticket to heaven. <laughs> and I'll have lived all the way I wanted to on this world and then uh, get to go to heaven anyway. And so it was a lie from Satan, that kind of thinking. And I remember uh, I even went, I stayed out of, after graduating from high school, I stayed out of school a year working secular jobs. And, um, you know, that didn't help at all really in my spiritual life. Uh, but I, I enrolled to go to Pensacola Christian College because of the price. Uh, I was the oldest of six. And so paying my own way, that was uh, a, a good, that was within my budget. And then also I felt comfortable in that Christian world. And so uh, I, I, I had no problem going to the Christian world, uh, going to a college and still playing the Christian game. So I went to study accounting and uh, my idea in life was to make lots of money. Uh, at the end of my freshman year is when God got a hold of my heart uh, by a, a sudden death in my family. Uh, my grandfather passed away, a, a, pa a pastor and um, kind of a, an interim pastor and uh, uh, as a retired man uh, working in the jail system. And uh, he, he died suddenly. My grandfather died suddenly preaching in a Wednesday night church service. Uh, he was at a church and just uh, had a heart attack while he was preaching and he died. And uh, that really shook me up because I realized how fragile life is and that I wasn't prepared to die. And so God used the, the sudden death of my grandfather, who was, you know, kind of my, my hero in life, uh, to, to really wake me up to the reality of how things were. I, I wasn't lacking in knowledge. I knew exactly what I needed to do. And it was just my heart had attitude needed to change. And so Right there in my dorm room, uh, <laughs> April 1997, I uh, repented of my sins and um, entrusted in Christ as my Savior. And uh, from there, that's when kind of my whole take on life changed as well. Now that I was uh, concerned about spiritual things, then I really rethought my direction in life as well. And that's, that's when I uh, struggled with the call to preach and, and surrendered and said, God, whatever you want me to do. Uh, so I changed my major uh, preemptively. I changed it to pastoral ministries, not knowing exactly the direction God would take me, but I was willing to do whatever, uh, whether that be pastoral ministry or evangelism or youth ministry or missionary work. Uh, I was just wanting to do full-time ministry now. And, uh, and so along the way, God directed my steps, uh, specifically in a missions conference that I attended. Uh, that's where God confirmed the call on my life to uh, to go into full-time ministry outside of the United States. And, uh, and so that set my, set my path toward uh, where I am today in Honduras. And so it was during your time in Bible college that the Lord started working your heart, I think specifically for Honduras. Talk to us a little bit about that. Okay, sure. So while I was in Bible college, you know, my sophomore year is when I surrendered to be a, a missionary, mm -hmm. but I didn't know where. And so uh, you know, I didn't know if I should spin the globe and put my finger down and wherever my finger landed, you know, that's where I'm going. Or I just didn't know, you know, if, if God was going to speak to me somehow. And so what I did was I, I chose a country uh, while I was in Bible college. I was sensitive to spiritual things. Uh, I was on a dating outing and we on this dating outing, we went to see a video in the IMAX theater about Mount Everest. So it's kind of like a documentary. But all I could see in that video was just the spiritual needs of that region. And so I chose the country of Nepal as, uh, wow. as my target and said, I'm going to go to wow. Nepal as a missionary unless God uh, changes my direction. Mm. And, and so I even you know, met a student that was at Pensacola uh, from Nepal. And so we started talking and he was teaching me the alphabet and some phrases. <laughs> wow. uh, and so you know, we were, I was kind of heading that direction. But then I remember specifically in a, in a student group called Mission Prayer Band, mm -hmm. uh, a, a missionary came through there. And he was talking about the needs in Latin America and how the harvest was so ripe in Latin America right now uh, with um, the, the, just the lack of confidence in Catholicism and um, disillusionment. And then the Pentecostal movement was coming in. And so there was a, a ripeness and, a, and an openness in Latin America and large metropolitan areas that needed Christian works. And so uh, that's when I felt like God really 
tugging <laughs> on my heart toward Latin America. And, uh, and so I started praying and saying, God, if that's, if that's your path for me, then, uh, you know, just confirm this. And so I, it was probably, you know, I took 10 days, two weeks, just praying about Latin America and, and really felt confidence that that's the way God was leading. And so then it was like, okay, which country in Latin America? <laughs> so a friend of mine in college, uh, we were both missions majors or, or ministry majors. He was missions, I was pastoral, uh, but we would start praying every Thursday night about a different country in Latin America, just wow. doing it alphabetical order. He also had a burden for Latin America. We ended up working together in Honduras for six years. And so, uh, you know, we, we uh, prayed and, and um, I would say it was after I graduated that God really uh, honed in on Honduras specifically mm -hmm. through needs that we were seeing, through people that we met, uh, just kind of Honduras kept popping up. And so we thought, let's go visit Honduras and see and see what's going on there and that when we visited Honduras 2002 that's when God confirmed in our hearts uh, my wife and I that that's that's where God would have us to be okay and so it was also during Bible college I, I believe where you met your wife and uh, right. you both um, did you get married right out of college and then you worked a little while in a church before you started deputation is that correct that's right so Delita and I met uh, my freshman year. She was a sophomore. She was a year ahead of me, and uh, she was studying nursing, wanting to go into missions. Uh, back when, back before I was even saved, I met her, and she mm -hmm. was wanting to go into missions. And mm -hmm. you know, it was just a kind of a meeting, and we knew each other, but that was it. And um, and she wanted to go into missions. She studied nursing in case she ended up single and mm -hmm. could still use nursing as as a platform for missions. And uh, it wasn't until like later on in college that we started getting romantically involved and started dating. Uh, but yes, we, we married right out of college and worked at a local church where I was interning in Florida for two years just to get some ministry experience, uh, West Florida Baptist Church, which is now my sending church. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we got that ministry experience, visited Honduras after those two years, and then started deputation right away. Okay. And so at this stage, you guys are, are pretty young. You're probably under 25 years old when you're on deputation. Is that about right? Right. Okay. That's so you're right. young and you guys um, do deputation. I know uh, very quickly, uh, the Lord blessed greatly. I remember that time stage in your life. And then you go to language school for about a year or so. Is that correct? That's right. So we did right. deputation about a year and a half, uh, mm -hmm. mid-2002 to the end of 2003, January 1st, 2004, we flew uh, hmm. out of Pensacola down to San Jose, Costa Rica to start language school. And we were in San Jose for, for a whole year uh, mm -hmm. studying, studying language. Uh, we had one son at the time. A second one was born while mm -hmm. we were in Costa Rica. So my wife got tutored while I went to the formal language institute. And then at the end of 2004, we moved straight to Honduras. So now, you know, since the Lord has worked in your heart, you, you, you accept him as savior. You're really going full board towards the ministry during college. You get married, you get trained, you go on deputation, you get language training. Now you're hitting the mission field and you're hitting mission field pretty quickly. Cause like you said, you went to language school and then right to Honduras. Walk us through a little bit now, as we talk about those first few years on the field, I believe you went with the team, con the team concept there and you guys went to the city of El, Pro El Progreso. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So, uh, I mentioned uh, my partner in ministry in uh, college. So we, you know, we kind of decided in college, hey, why don't we work together? We're going to the mission field. We're going to Latin America. Uh, why don't we work together in the same ministry and do it kind of a team concept? And so that, that worked out for us. Um, my family arrived in Honduras, December 17th, 2004. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my friend and his family arrived in Honduras the second week of January 2005. And so within three weeks of each other, uh, more or less, uh, we got to the field together. Uh, we had made survey trips, three separate occasions, my wife and I the first time, and then uh, my friend and I the other two times, uh, just by ourselves, scoping out the, the country, seeing where the needs were. We landed on uh, El Progreso, which is the third largest city in Honduras. We didn't know of any foreign missionaries uh, here. Uh, but there were some, uh, you know, I, churches that we would consider uh, sound doctrine, uh, maybe not exactly like we are, but uh, for a city of, of over 200,000, there was a lot of room for uh, more, more good, solid gospel preaching churches. So 
We arrived here and started the church in uh, April of 2005, just, you know, basically hitting a target neighborhood mm. and parking our vehicles and started doing door-to-door, -door, you know, just door-to-door -door witnessing and meeting people, telling them about Jesus. Um, a, a family that we met within those first couple of weeks invited us to come back and do Bible studies on their front porch mm. every Sunday. And so that's really where we started doing Sunday morning uh, meetings was on the front porch of somebody's house uh, and just started inviting people to come over. Hey, at this time, we're going to do a Bible study. And, and then uh, on, a win on Wednesday nights, we started meeting in our homes, uh, taking turns and having a midweek service for that same group. And that was the, the beginnings of what is now Iglesia Bautista del Faro, a Beacon Baptist Church here in El Progreso, uh, Honduras. And it's very exciting. I've had the privilege to go visit Matt and Delita a few times. And I believe one of the times we were there, uh, we, you pointed out the neighborhood and showed me the area where you first started. And it's very exciting to see uh, how the Lord starts in small places sometimes. And yeah. um, so when you first get to El Progreso, um, if you can remember that far back, uh, talk to us <laughs> about a little bit about maybe some of the culture shock you and Delita and the boys experienced, or maybe just some adjustments that were different than maybe you even anticipated yourself right sure so uh i am i grew up in the northern virginia area so everything <laughs> is very structured and and very very busy mm -hmm. and so i came with that mentality kind of a go 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 you know driven mentality and uh, i had a hard time waiting uh, which if anybody's been to latin america you understand <laughs> that's just part of life here is <laughs> waiting in lines and um and I would get very impatient with people, maybe cutting the line or traffic patterns where it wasn't following, uh, you know, the, the black and white, you know, law and order. Uh, so I had a very difficult time in the beginning with uh, with that type of thing. I thought, you know, that's not right. They're cutting or or they're, uh, you know, going through the red light. And, um, you know, I, I had a, I had to step back and really just just chill out. And really let the Holy Spirit produce the fruit of uh, love and joy and peace and long suffering and gentleness, <laughs> goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and really just live that out on the mission field because it was that was one of the frustrating things uh, for me coming here is just the the style of life and the and the pace of life uh, was a lot different. I think for my so, wife it was more of the fellowship issue, mm. you know, as far as um, she she ended up doing tutoring in Costa Rica for language school, whereas I got to go to a formal language institute with other classmates and interact mm -hmm. with people. She's at home uh, with our son and another one on the way. And, and, uh, and then when we get to the mission field, you know, I'm able to get out and uh, start doing the door knocking. The, the couple we came with didn't have any kids. And so uh, she felt kind of left out in the beginning uh, or, you know, thrown in the nursery with the kids. Uh, and, and that was something, you know, as a, as a young, immature husband, I wasn't, I was late to, to see and, uh, and really needed to be more intentional about involving her in ministry and, and even the fellowship that comes with that. And uh, listeners, to, for you to know, I've been able to visit a few times. Uh, Matt has corrected that. The Belita is very well <laughs> in, uh, involved in the ministry. She is the church piano player, teaches Sunday school classes, and uh, speaks very good Spanish. So, uh, yes. but that that is a hard adjustment for wives. A lot of times, if they're maybe a little bit behind sometimes in the language curve because they're doing so many other things, and if they're not involved right away, uh, those can be hindrances. But uh, uh, Matt and Delita are um, just. Terrific examples of a team uh, as a marriage uh, working together uh, in the ministry. So, all right, now you've been on the ministry, uh, on the field, Matt, for a few years. Um, it's inevitable, uh, whether it's the first year or the first few years, that we face uh, disappointments, setbacks, unfulfilled expectations. Now, your church, for those who, like myself, who followed over the years, has had so many highlights and blessings and, and things that are really just to be modeled but as we know, there are always setbacks and disappointments. As you experience those kinds of uh, difficulties in the ministry, how did you handle those situations? And then how did they help form your ministry that you have now? Well, that's a good question. You know, I think as any missionary listening to this will understand that we don't put everything in the prayer letter. You know, mm -hmm. we just hit the highlights and mm -hmm. uh, sometimes people just are unaware of, of what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, in the, the bumps in the road and 
I think, uh, you know, looking back, God uses every, every situation to grow us and to mold us, uh, you know, to take the sandpaper and, uh, you know, <laughs> scrape off the rough edges sometimes. And, uh, and so I, I see that in the, the difficulties that we've had along the way. I think, I think every time that uh, we hit a valley, it really just drove me closer to God and uh, understanding that uh, my, my eyes needed to be on him and that my confidence is in him. And my calling was uh, based on, on his will in my life and not on another person or, or circumstances or even the people we're ministering to. Uh, I'm, I'm here because uh, there's a, a, God, uh, a call of God on my life. Uh, and so, you know, I look at it as a victory, even those moments where we just had some very difficult times or, um, you know, lots of tears and disappointments. Uh, if it drove me closer to God, then it's a victory and, uh, and, and God used it for his glory. And, and so, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna take this time to air out all my, uh, sure, sure. my dirty laundry, but, but for sure, you know, God has been good during this whole time. And I, I feel that it strengthened it strengthened my faith in God, and uh, it, it really sobered sobered me up to uh, the fr fragility of man as well, as far as uh, how susceptible we are to uh, to to falling away if we're not careful. Like even Paul said, you know, uh, didn't want to be caught preaching to others and then become a shipwreck himself. And so, uh, I think that's that's something that has it's kind of helped me as a young. As a young man coming out of Bible college, you feel like you can conquer the world, and you know, uh, you know everything's going your way, and and uh, sometimes there's a, a God uses things to to humble you a little bit and uh, mm -hmm. bring you down, and just let a, let you remember that uh, it's only by His grace that we're doing what we're doing, and and uh, there's any success at all in ministry. You know, uh, I've been very blessed to be a good close friend of Matt's for many years, and from afar to see the ups and downs sometimes in life, as we both all experience that. Uh, I can say that I've seen how Matt has been formed and believe have been formed in their character. And I believe sometimes from big bumps so that the Lord can use them for even bigger things down the yeah. road. And that's kind of what we want to transition to now, kind of the meat and potatoes of what we're going to talk to today is that, um, you know, I, I feel blessed. Well, the Lord has blessed our ministry here in the Dominican. We've been able to have a couple of uh, pieces of church property. But, you know, even as missionaries, you have to deal with jealousy. And uh, we have one of the biggest church pieces of property for Dominican churches I know. But the one day I went to visit Matt, I did the calculations. He had a piece of property that was 40 times larger than ours. All right. So, <laughs> so well, we say that uh, tongue in cheek, we're laughing, but the Lord has greatly blessed the ministry there. And we're going to kind of go in now after Matt's been there and his, his teammates and they've established this church. Um, now the Lord starts giving them other opportunities to reach their community. And one of those is a was a really amazing opportunity. Now, many of our listeners may be familiar with the Hope Children Home located in Florida. Matt can tell us a little bit more about that. But they uh, kind of came and approached Matt and his teammate about an amazing opportunity. Matt, why don't you give us the genesis behind that? Sure. And I'll, I'll lead, lead into this by saying that uh, when we went to the mission field, um, I, you could say that I had a small vision as far as uh, I didn't have it all mapped out as far as what mm -hmm. things would look like. But I, I think uh, looking back, that's the best way to do it because, um, you know, what's happening here in Honduras isn't going to be a cookie cutter mm -hmm. uh, pattern for everybody else. Right. Uh, I think we all just need to be led by the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we, we can be guilty of over planning and just say, <laughs> this is what it's going to look like. And this is what I'm going to do. And these are the ministries I'm going to do. And, and um, that's good, but we also need to have it, you know, in, in pencil and not pen and, and yeah, just right. uh, let God form it. And, and that's, that's what we've seen here. I didn't come in to uh, ministry thinking we're going to have a large ministry campus or that mm -hmm. we would have partner ministries that would enhance the reach of the local church. Uh, yet God in his perfect will guided us to meet the right people and to have the right resources come our way uh, to where now we have, um, we do have a large ministry campus a solid local church that's been formed and uh, preparing laborers to be sent out and start new churches and be missionaries. And then we have partnership with, um, with two separate ministries. We have a partnership with Hope Children's Home in Tampa, Florida mm -hmm. for reaching um, uh, at-risk children. 
And then we have a partner ministry with Medical Missions Outreach uh, out of Atlanta, Georgia, and, uh, and reaching out with people's physical needs. Uh, so I'll start with, you know, how the home uh, partnership came about. It was while I was on deputation, actually, uh, we were raising money to go to Honduras. And I had two phone calls come my way just out of the blue. Uh, one was a, um, a man, Mike Higgins. Uh, he is the executive director of Hope Children's Home in Tampa, Florida. He reached out and said, hey, look, I, I just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, we have property in Honduras on the coast. And we are wanting to do a children's home on the, uh, there in Honduras. And I'm just networking with other missionaries that are independent Baptists like we are uh, to, you know, just uh, introduce ourselves and then maybe possibly in the future have a relationship where we get together for fellowship and things like that. If you're ever in the Tampa area, please come look us up. And that was my first introduction to Hope Children's Home. And, uh, and he was just very kind and, and uh, wanted to introduce himself. And so I filed it away and I thought, okay, if I ever go down that way, we'll look him up and, and possibly cross paths in Honduras one day. Not long after that, I got a phone call from a, a U.S. soldier who was stationed in Iraq uh, named Jeff Braun. And he called me and uh, the connection was horrible. And he, he reached out. I remember I was in Pennsylvania visiting my parents. It was in the fall. And uh, he, he introduced himself as well and said, hey, I got your name from your chapel, from my chaplain, who is from Chattanooga, Tennessee, which happens to be where our mission agency is, BIMI. And, and so he said, I, I have questions about Honduras because I'm from Honduras. I was adopted from Honduras. I've grown up in Connecticut in a Catholic family. And uh, I've got this money in reserve uh, from a lawsuit that my parents won when I was a, a young child. And I don't want to use it for college or, or a car. I want to use it to help kids like me from Honduras. And so I want to do a children's home. Mm -hmm. And so he was asking me about land prices and, uh, you know, cost of food and uh, all of these uh, logistical things that I had no idea. Uh, I didn't even speak Spanish yet. I hadn't, I had only been to Honduras on a visit. We were on our way. Wow. And, and so uh, we got cut off and then we ended up reconnecting a couple of weeks later and talking. And I, after thinking about it, I told Jeff, I said, look, uh, I'm not sure you'd really want to throw in with us because we are going to Honduras and I, I'm open to helping the kids there with the children's home ministry. Uh, however, uh, doctrinally, we're not, we're not the same, you know, and, um, you know, you told me that you're a Catholic and that's not, uh, you know, we, we don't agree doctrinally. And, and then he backed up and he said, look, I don't know what I am anymore. Before I was deployed <laughs> to Iraq, um, I talked to my chaplain, who's a Baptist chaplain, and, and uh, I accepted Christ as my savior. So I don't know what I am anymore. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, that's, that's great. And so that you know, opened up maybe the possibility. And so he said, I'm just looking for someone to help uh, so that we can use this money that I have for children's home. Wow. And so I said, well, look, I just met a guy over the phone that has property in Honduras. He's wanting to do children's home. Let me connect you with him so that you, he can answer your questions, at least as far as prices and all the logistics. And, uh, and so we left it at that. Mm -hmm. uh, but before, and I sent him the email with the contact information, but before they could make contact, uh, Jeff was killed in action in, in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, very sad situation. Uh, but his, his family got the email that I had sent with the contact for Mike Higgins at Hope Children's Home. And so they contacted me and they contacted Mike Higgins and said, we want Jeff's dream uh, to stay alive, to have a children's home in Honduras. And so we're going to partner with Hope Children's Home so that they can build a home in Honduras uh, in Jeff's name. And so I thought that was amazing. You know, that was great. But that was the end of the story for me because uh, their property was three hours away from where we were looking at starting a church. Well, to make a long story short, uh, things didn't work out where Hope had property. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they had come down and visited and we had made contact personally and they, uh, we helped them get a rental car and things to go out and visit that property. But things just didn't work out. Things fell through. They sold that property and then circled back around and said, hey, would you guys starting this church in El Progreso be willing to let us come alongside you and focus on the children's part of the ministry mm -hmm. and partner together? so that uh, our children are, will have a good local church to go to. 
and uh, you know you will have oversight over the ministry and we'll provide the, the logistical support and the funding, but we want it to be under your oversight. And so my partner and I flew to Tampa, met with, um, with the administration there at Hope Children's Home, and uh, here we are, um, you know, several years later, having partnered together in the first cottage that we built on our property is the Jeff Braun Cottage in honor of Jeff Braun, who funded it uh, with the money that he had in reserve. And so it was unsolicited, and, uh, and God worked it out for us to partner together. Now there are close to 30 children living on property in two separate cottages, uh, one set of house parents that are Americans, the others are Hondurans, mm -hmm. and uh, several staff members, and uh, they're making a difference in the lives of these children uh, that have been abandoned, neglected, and, uh, you know, we're seeing God's uh, love break through, you know, having them in this environment and uh, seeing them make spiritual decisions for Christ and uh, grow up and make, uh, make good decisions to follow the lord well i i remember you telling that story i forgot some of the details that is an amazing story that when the lord presents those types of situations to us sometimes it is literally like he is writing it in the clouds that is uh something that is just amazing to remember and recount uh how god uh, really miraculously worked through circumstances and directed through his uh sovereign will that I, that is a tremendous story and one that I think we'll encourage everyone to hear um, as the Lord maybe sometimes will guide you down a path that you may may or may not want to go down. And that's kind of just a little, you know, as you and your teammate uh, were considering this, I know that the the Hope Christian Home, they were the ones kind of initiating and a lot of these, these, these uh, requests. And, and But as you had that focus on starting a local New Testament church, what kind of things did you weigh or thinking about uh, before you decided to say, okay, we can see how this can, can we can partner together. Sure. Uh, first of all, I think we really needed to define what we wanted to focus on. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I didn't want to focus on children's ministry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I knew that my time would be divided having to do both. Uh, I wanted to focus, uh, God's call in my life was to focus on church planting and, uh, and, you know, pastoring and preparing leaders for generational impact here. And so, and, we, and my partner was in the, of the same uh, mindset. And so we knew that somebody else would have to come alongside to, to actually focus on that part of the ministry. Somebody called to do that ministry. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I, if any, anybody missionary or otherwise listening to this, uh, you know, my counsel would be just uh, be careful not to divide your focus on some, on things that are good. Uh, because mm -hmm. uh, then, then we end up not doing anything totally well. And so uh, that was something we defined early on. And then also uh, just the, the, how this partnership would work uh, as, as far as uh, we knew that we would have administrative oversight, yet it would, we would not micromanage it. Uh, somebody representing Hope would run things down here. And so we needed to talk with the folks from Hope about uh, you know, those type of details, uh, decision making and, uh, you know, keeping things all going the same direction philosophically, uh, merging two things together as far as a, a church that is not funding a, a ministry of the church yet is partnering to come alongside the ministry of a local church. And so uh, things that, you know, never uh, never, never learned in, in Bible college, for sure, because it's a unique situation. Yeah, God's given grace and, and wisdom in, among all the parties uh, so that we've had a, a harmonious relationship. And uh, Brother Mike Higgins is one of my good friends, uh, despite, you know, let alone partnering in ministry, you know, we are, we are good friends as well. And uh, that, that helps big time. So uh, while this is happening, this is happening pretty early on in the ministry, but, you know, the, the children's home doesn't come for a few more years later, but all the, the spokes are in their motion, they're moving. There's another aspect of, as you're focusing on local New Testament church, another aspect of maybe some of the ways you were reaching the community with evangelistic outreach was through your partnership with MMO. Why don't you talk a little bit about that, and then we'll get to the, the, the kind of the final, one of the final results of that being your surgical center. Okay. So yes, early on, a friend of mine from college, Bradley Edmondson, um, reached out and said, look, I'm... Uh, 
I'm starting a new ministry. My wife and I, my wife's a nurse, a uh, nurse practitioner, and we're doing uh, medical, short-term medical trips where we're visiting countries, taking medical professionals, um, offering free medical services, free mm -hmm. medic medical supplies while supplies last. And we really, what we're doing is we're coming alongside local churches so that uh, after we leave, the church can then do spiritual follow-up. And so mm -hmm. uh, we thought, you know, yeah, great idea as far as uh, we'll try it out. And so that was probably after we had started the church, maybe a year and a half after we started the church, we hosted the first medical missions outreach team. Wow. And uh, we did it kind of farther away from the church than, than we would now have understanding now how things work. Uh, we weren't able to do as much spiritual follow-up after that first trip. And so we, we've changed things along the way, mm -hmm. uh, but it did, it gave us an opportunity to reach out into the community. Uh, this country is a, a, a social medicine uh, uh, country where uh, it's free medical services but you have to wait in lines. And once you see the medical professional, mm -hmm. usually they don't have any medicines available or uh, yes, free surgeries, but you have to wait 18 months before you get your surgery many times and you still have to buy all of the supplies for it to get done. And, and so we saw a great need physically here. So these medical professionals started coming down first, just general medicine and then dental work as well, optical, and then even surgical teams. Uh, and we were just helping out in the community, yet at the same time, it wasn't just the missionaries hosting the team. Our local church was hosting the team, and the, their team that was coming from the United States needed to have translators, needed to have mm -hmm. uh, people doing registration, people doing crowd control, mm -hmm. people doing evangelism, and that was all provided by the local church. And so it was a perfect way for our church to flex its spiritual muscles and really just kind of uh, get involved and let my people here in Honduras mm -hmm. also get a vision for helping their own people physically and spiritually. And so that, that started a trend where we hosted them every year for the next, well, where, wherever we are now, 15 <laughs> years now wow. later, uh, hosting them every single year uh, to, to help out in the community doing these short-term mission trips. It's neat. The two different times I've visited Matt and Delita's um, church there, uh, there have been a number of people that Matt would point out who are serving in the church, and he would oftentimes say, hey, we, we met that person through that outreach with MMO or that outreach in the community. And so uh, as a missionary, knowing what it's like to host groups, not nearly sometimes the size of the ones that Matt has, I understand that it's you, you have to be almost half crazy to want to do the things. But when he sees the spiritual fruit that comes from that, I know uh, that he and Delita will, will, will gladly keep having those kinds of groups because the Lord has blessed it greatly. So now you have an MMO uh, every year. How does this idea come about having something more permanent on your location, this uh, surgical center? So we started hosting the, like I said, the short-term teams. And eventually we started hosting short-term surgical teams along with the visiting medical team. So in those situations, uh, for the general medical team, we would ask for permission to use a school complex for the week. Mm -hmm. And then for this hospital, uh, for the surgical teams, we would have to go to the local hospital and ask permission to use one of their operating rooms for the week. Mm -hmm. And so we, we explored the idea. The local hospital was open to the idea. And so they loaned us a, an operating room at the local hospital for the week that the medical team was here. And it, it went well the first couple of times we did this. Uh, we would do their surgical patients that were on the waiting list, you know, typically a 12 month to 18 month uh, wait to do a, a selective surgery like a hernia repair or a gallbladder removal, things like that. They would only get to people when it became an emergency. Mm. Wow. And, and so, but then uh, we, we, ex we continued doing this and we brought down an orthopedic team. And when we had the orthopedic team, we had two different ORs going at the local mm -hmm. hospital. We had a general uh, surgeon and we had an orthopedic surgeon. And the orthopedic team was, uh, was having some difficulty getting cases uh, because they mainly did emergency cases for ortho. And so and it was just very chaotic that week. Um, we had a hard time working with the hospital. They ended up canceling cases on us because 
they didn't have uh, sterilized bedding uh, for one of the days. Uh, electric went out one time. And so it was very frustrating mm-hmm. to have these medical professionals here mm-hmm. able to do a lot, help, able to work for the community and help a lot of people and yet underutilizing their abilities. And so one of the doctors on the team, once we got back, you know, in the evenings together and had a brainstorm, one of the doctors uh, suggested and said, look, if you guys want to continue doing surgical teams, I would suggest uh, doing it on your own and uh, building your own facility and organizing everything so that at the moment of bringing down doctors who are, you know, donating their valuable time, you can utilize them to their strengths and and uh, they want to come here to serve and so get the best out of them that you can. And so, you know, in that brainstorm session thrown out there on the table, um, you know, Bradley Edmondson was kind of shaking his head. Yeah, that's a good idea. And um, and, I, and the doctor said, you know, there's plenty of property here where you guys could do something. And I said, well, if you want to raise the funding uh, to Bradley, if you want to raise the funding, I'll donate a quarter of the property so that you guys can <laughs> build a surgical center. But it kind of died right there. Almost, we thought uh, it was like, OK, you know, we, we are willing, but that's where that's where it ended. Um, a few months later, I can't remember the exact time frame, but not long after uh, somebody called in to to the medical missions outreach headquarters and asked how they could help out with um, what's going on in the ministry. And uh, so she wanted to give toward a, a larger purchase. So he threw out um, a, a portable sonogram machine that costed about $750 and said, we could really use something like this on our teams. And so this, uh, this woman said, we'll do that. You know, what else do you have? Uh, we're, we're looking for some year end projects. And so uh, he said, well, we, you know, she's like something bigger. So he said, well, we are considering the possibilities of a surgical center in Honduras. And so she said, tell me about that. And, uh, and so he told her what we were looking at doing. And, and she asked, you know, how much would something like that cost? And, and, and uh, I believe Bradley was texting me even during this phone call and said, hey, you know, how much for something like this? Um, you know, rough, rough estimate. And so I thought, you know, I'm thinking, you know, labor is cheap. Materials are cheaper down here. Probably $100,000 could get us get us going. And so um, the, the woman told Bradley on the phone and said, all right, checks in the mail for $100,000 for you guys to do a surgical center in Honduras. That's when we got serious about the surgical center. Oh my when goodness. Money came our way, unsolicited once again. And, uh, and so then we got serious about plans and how we would want it done. And we realized we want two operating rooms we want, uh, we need a recovery area. We need an overnight stay area for men and for women. We want uh, dormitories upstairs for the doctors to stay in. So a second story. And so we got it designed exactly how we would want it and realized that we had lowballed the quote mm-hmm. and uh, it wasn't going to be $100,000. It would be more like $300,000 for what we wanted to do. <laughs> Can I call you back? Yeah. And so we, we realized uh, we had, we had told uh, this family that we could get it done for a hundred thousand. So we actually met uh, when, when medical missions and outreach was still stationed or headquartered in Baltimore, Mm -hmm. uh, the Edmondson's and my family and uh, this donor donor family met together in Baltimore and we just laid it all out. We laid out the architectural drawings, what we wanted to do, the plans, and we said, look, we, uh, we gave you the understanding that you would be able to fund this entirely with your mm-hmm. gift, but it's not going to be the case. If we want to do it the way we want to do it, we're going to need more money. And so we are willing to give you back all of your money since you were un- of the understanding you would fund it all. Or, um, you know, we'll keep your money, but with the understanding that you have now that it wasn't going to cover everything that we'll need to still raise more money to get this done. And I'll never forget the, the lady looked over at her husband. You know, this is a, an older couple, a very successful business, but very humble. It would ne- very unassuming. You would never know that they had wealth that they're, that they're giving. And she looked over at him. Uh, after we told them we we're going to need $200,000 more, she looked over at him. He gave a slight nod, and, and she said, we're sending the check for $200,000 more. So that this can get done. <laughs> oh my goodness. 
And so we received $300,000 from one source unsolicited mm. to build the Rerick Surgical Center, which is on our property now. Uh, this was the first year of operation. We've hosted three surgical teams uh, helping with gallbladder removal, hernia repair. We had an ortho team this last time. My wife just had her gallbladder taken out after needing it for about two years wow. here on our property uh, with this surgical team. And so... Well, that's a recommendation. Uh, it's, it's been amazing to see what God has done. Yeah. Well, that is an, another amazing story that uh, let's just say that doesn't happen every day as we understand that as missionaries. Yeah. And yet it's also an amazing illustration of God's provision, God's sovereignty. Uh, and even where you guys had this amazing, I mean, you know, someone gives you $100,000 and you have to go back to them and tell them, yeah. hey, I'm sorry, and, and, and be willing to give it back. And then the Lord just continues to say, no, puts this stamp of approval on and says, this is what I need yeah. you to do. And, and I know from just different smaller ministries we've ever done that to, 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 to endeavor to do something like the children's home and to do the surgical center and then to have the thriving church that you have um, requires not only God's blessing and provision, but also requires... Um, just understanding of what God's called you to do. And then the, the fortitude to say, you know, I may not be doing all this work, but we're kind of responsible. And so as yeah. we transition now, Matt, to, towards the end of this podcast, um, what are some advice? You spoke a little bit about it, but we understand that those who are going to be listening to this, it's not an apples to apple situation. Very yeah. seldom is. The, the point of this podcast really is missionary perspective. The idea is that we don't think, as you mentioned, it's cookie cutter, but the principles that we take from God's word and through our experiences can often be applied in different ways. And so that's why we're putting out other testimonies for people to hear. So with that yeah. in mind, Matt, what advice would you give to someone who's listening today, who's thinking about adding another a ministry like the children's home, the surgical center, maybe it's a feeding center, something along those lines, what kind of criteria and filter would you uh, encourage them to have in their lives before they take that plunge? Oh, it's a good question. Uh, first thought that comes to mind is go slow, mm -hmm. <laughs> go slow and um, make sure that God's stamp of approval is on it and not rush into anything. Um, it's easy to, to make emotional decisions and overextend ourselves. And, um, you know, I'm maybe my personality is more this way, but I'm more of a uh, I'd like to be more sure footed instead of uh, taking risks and, and calling it faith, I would rather uh, establish something that is going to uh, stand the test of time and, and have deep roots rather than build quickly uh, upon a flimsy foundation. And so I would say go slow and make sure the Holy Spirit is guiding in every step of the way. Uh, you know, obviously the, the word of God and prayer uh, biblical counsel, you know, mm -hmm. reaching out to other missionaries, to your own uh, sending pastor, friends in ministry, people that are going to shoot straight with you mm -hmm. and, um, and and make sure that you're not rushing into anything because, you know, God, we never dreamed of where we would be right now. Uh, it's just God leading the way and, and bringing those contacts our way or the resources or putting that desire in our heart and, and just letting him guide us in where we are today. Well, that's very, very sound advice and uh, one that we all should take to a heart. Okay, Matt, uh, one of the last questions I have is um, we're, we're often um, reaching young missionaries who are on their first term or missionaries uh, in language school or deputation or even people considering missions. What is one area you would encourage a missionary as being a veteran now, much a very old missionary, I would say. No, you're not old, but uh, a missionary who's preparing themselves uh, what's one thing, maybe as you look back now, that you wish you had better prepared mentally, spiritually, physically, or just something you've learned that you did do that you want to encourage young missionaries uh, to be in preparation as they head towards the mission field? Okay, uh, I would say uh, definitely language is has got to be uh, top priority. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to communicate the, the precious truths of the gospel in the right way if you don't learn how to speak their language. And that's not even just uh, the verbal, but even the nonverbal, you know, so uh, reading books on, on cultural adaptation, taking mm -hmm. a class on that, uh, any, any type of anything that you can do to prepare the way. I mean, we're always, as a foreign missionary, we're, we'll always be foreign. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but we can adapt to the point where they accept us as as one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but learning the language is going to be the first foot in the door, and then learning those cultural cues so that you're not offensive in in the way that you say things or the the way that you carry yourself even. I think uh, another, you know, that was a, more of a, on the, along the lines of cultural, but, but then, you know, keeping in mind what we're here to do, uh, the spiritual <laughs> impact, uh, I, I wish that I had been better uh, equipped to study the Bible, mm -hmm. um, interpreting the Bible, uh, in its proper context, uh, not to slight any church or uh, any college that I attended, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. but just the, the my focus then was more of a general ministry and knowledge, Bible knowledge, but uh, equipping myself to, to teach myself from the Word of God and do an expositional study of the Word of God. And then uh, in from the pulpit, having a pulpit ministry that is expositional that will teach the people what the Bible says so that when it comes time for maybe the missionary to leave, uh, the people can stand on their own spiritual feet and not be dependent on somebody to curate the Bible for them, but actually extract God's message from the word. Uh, that, that would be, those would be the, top, the, the two pronged priorities I think of is just being able to communicate properly and be able, able to um, have the content to communicate that's going to have lasting spiritual impact. Oh, those are terrific things to consider and missionary. Uh, please listen to the voice of experience. Uh, one last question. I actually didn't put this in our notes, um, but you love missions and missions conferences. Are there any mission videos you'd, rec you'd, uh, you'd recommend for your missions conference for anybody? All right, I got to tell this story. I'm, I'm, I'm making <laughs> Matt laugh right now, but we have to end on kind of a funny note. When I got to visit Matt a number of years ago, Matt asked me, hey, do you know of any good mission documentaries, ideas for missions? And I said, oh, yeah, I found this really great documentary about Jim Elliott and uh, his, his buddies. And, and there's a terrific, well, I didn't specify the exact name of it. Or if I did, I can't give, give a generalization of it. And the one I was referring to had been made just a few years earlier. Well, I didn't communicate that. And Matt found a different one. And he started playing it during one of their meals at a missions conference. Let's just say it had a lot to do with people from the jungle. And we're upstairs watching this video. And I, I said, wow, where'd you get this video? There's a lot of um, people from the jungle, we'll just say. And Matt is like, this is the video you told me to play. And we had a good laugh. Is that, is that how you remember it, Matt? Yeah, I would add in council, don't just uh, accept anybody's recommendation, but actually <laughs> vet it yourself. <laughs> Watch the video. Oh my goodness. Watch the I, video to, first. To this day, about every year when we're having a missions conference, I'll send Matt a text, hey, you got any video recommendations? So those are the fun things <laughs> you experience on the mission field. Matt, if uh, our listeners today would like to contact you or follow your ministry, how can they find you on the World Wide Web? Yeah, so we have a website, uh, teamhonduras.com. And, uh, and I will, I want to plug, throw a plug in here before we end too about team, because uh, I'm the one that has uh, the benefit of being the face behind what's going on <laughs> here right now, you know, in this interview. And yet, um, it's been so much more about a team effort, not not just me or my family. Uh, we've had some tremendous teammates along the way. Currently, we have teammates that are um, just helping things go smoothly and we're all in the same mindset. And so uh, I've had the tremendous benefit of working on a team almost exclusively. Mm -hmm. And so it's not about me or my family. And, and really all of us would say it's all about what God's been doing through us. But, but I do want to say that before we end that, uh, you know, don't think, oh, Matt, go and super missionary. <laughs> uh, it's been a team effort. And so we can be found at, uh, we have a website, teamhonduras.com to give a little bit about each family and the ministries that we run. And then um, we, we're on uh, Facebook as well, uh, Team Honduras. You can uh, uh, search Team Honduras on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and, and we have a presence, although um, I'm of that generation that's not very <laughs> active on social media, but try to get people around me that'll help us, help us out with that. <laughs> Well, I encourage everyone who's listening today to uh, follow them on Facebook, Instagram, wherever you 
uh, find those uh, avenues because uh, they put a lot of information out about their church. And it's very exciting, especially as a missionary, to get ideas and see the different things the Lord is doing there in Honduras. Well, Matt, thanks so much for your time. Uh, we, we, is there one thing we could be praying for you, your family, or the ministry right now? Uh, you know, just continued wisdom as we move forward. Um, we're, you know, trying to, you know, do ministry through and, and then hopefully coming out on the other side of a pandemic and uh, just the adjustments that we're needing to make and, and really still trying to focus on theological education uh, to start multiplying. And that, that's where my heart is right now. Well, this is the first time we've had Matt on, but hopefully it won't be the last. We'd like to have him on talk about things like that, about training nationals, and maybe even about teammates specifically. But listener, please take time to like, subscribe to our podcast, share it with other people who might be interested. And we want to just thank you for your time and your encouragement. Contact us at the Missionary Perspective Podcast on Facebook or Missionary Perspective Podcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening and have a great day.